Good evening and welcome to take two of the ATAR and new QC system. So I'm recording from home here and I'm narrating over this, this PowerPoint that I would have shared with you this evening. There'll be an opportunity for you to uh, ask questions, but it will be uh, not live. So via the chat function in my Microsoft Teams, hopefully. So without any further ado, I'll run through the first few slides again. So let me just get my going. There we go. So there's the overview as to what I'm going to cover this evening. And the first thing I'm going to briefly talk about is the QCAA. So the QCAA become very important in senior years, but they are working in the background and they do provide a lot of advice and um, syllabus deconstruction and interpretation of the Australian curriculum for Queensland schools all the way through from um, kindy actually all the way through to year 12. Uh, in the senior years, we, we interact a particularly with the QCAA because they write the syllabuses that the students study in years 11 and 12. So um, up to year 10, we base our school programs on the Australian curriculum. And there is some external testing in the form of NAPLAN, but that's sort of ramped up a stage when you get into years 11 and 12, where there's a lot more oversight. I suppose it's higher stakes in those senior years and the Queensland Curriculum um, and Assessment Authority have a huge role to play in that. They, we um, share our student data from their assessments that are done in school with the QCAA and they use the record of the student learning in order to issue the Queensland Certificate of Education which all of our students are aiming for at the end of year 12. The QCAA have a very, very um, good website. It's got a parent and carers section and it will break down and explain some of the things I'm going over quite quickly into a little bit more detail. So it's a wealth of information there and I recommend checking it out. So um, the other thing I'm going to talk about this evening is the ATAR. As you'll know from the, Queens, from the Queensland Press, and the media and so on. This year is the first year that we are doing ATAR in Queensland. They have used ATAR, or they still do use ATAR in other states, um, but their, their assessment programs are ever so slightly different and their syllabuses are slightly different from Queensland. So education is still very much a state-based um, affair, but we are coming in line with the other states in the fact that we are um, awarding an ATAR to our students who are looking to go to university. So the important point about ATAR is that not all students will be seeking to, to go on to your tertiary education and not all students will need an ATAR. So part of the um, planning process with our year 10 students looking at their year 11 and 12 pathway is very much geared around do they want to be ATAR eligible or would they, they prefer to choose a pathway that's perhaps looking more at going into the workforce or going on to an apprenticeship or that, that sort of pathway into the workforce. So although the majority of our students at Fraser Coast Anglican College are certainly ATAR eligible, not all of them are and nor would we expect them to be and we certainly don't try and hammer them into um, a pathway that doesn't work for them. So it's, it's done very very individualized and we're lucky enough to be able to offer a variety of pathways at the school i'll be talking a little bit about those um other points of note on that slide are the fact that um the old op system was in place right up to um last year uh, so it finished in 2019 so that the cutoff date this year 2020 is the first year that we'll be using ATAR. Um, it was introduced obviously for our year 12 students last year when they were in 2019 and it's meant a whole new curriculum for Queensland. So um, the QCAA have written syllabuses, rewritten syllabuses for existing subjects. So my, my subject that I teach Chemistry, the new chemistry syllabus is really quite different from the previous one that I was teaching under the OP system. And some new um, syllabuses have been written, totally new subjects, 
uh, for example, design, which is a subject we offer at Fraser Coast Anglican College. Previously, that didn't exist. Um, it's been brought on board in order to recognise different pathways um, within the technology uh, um, sort of faculty, I guess. Uh, the other point to note about the ATAR is that it's calculated not by QCAA, they take the data from school and they forward it on to a group called QTAC. So my next slide shows the QTAC logo there. So QTAC stands for Queensland Tertiary Admissions Centre. And our year 12 students who are looking at university pathways would apply to QTAC um, in about August, um, so about term three each year. And either myself or Miss Hallam or Mrs. Norland will do some work with the students on how to make those QTAC applications if they're looking for tertiary admissions. So they're through Queensland, but you can use your ATAR to apply to other states. And as I mentioned before, it's a rank not a grade, so um, students are compared against each other. In order to get a really good ATAR, you have to do very well in your subjects. So if you can get high grades or high marks for subjects, you will get a high ranking compared to every other student across Queensland. So it's relative to other Queensland students. And it ranges from 99.95, all the way down to zero. Although if you're in this end of things, they'll actually just tell you you've got less than 30 rather than kind of <laughs> pull that out too much. Um, realistically, most university courses would be looking for an ATAR significantly higher than 30. And you can hop onto university websites and look to see what um, rank or um, ATAR that they're, they're looking for highly competitive courses, not necessarily really difficult courses, but the courses that everybody wants to do can set their ATAR very high. So um, you can have some like very challenging, but um, not very popular courses. Their ATAR might seem quite low, um, but that's more to do with sort of grading who's going to be able to apply for the courses. So traditionally medicine is probably the most um, competitive um, course. Other subjects like engineering and law tend to be very competitive as well. And different universities will um, put that ATAR higher or lower depending on how many students they're likely to get applying and also how many places they've got available. So um, a high ATAR really just tells you um, how high in the state you are compared to everybody else and it would be the ticket into a university course. So what's changed since the old OP system? I won't spend too long on this slide but um, the, the main difference is that the OP went from 1 to 25 so OP1 was very high whereas this one goes from 99.5 the higher number is the better, great, better rank all the way down to as I said 30. Um, the old OP system was entirely worked out by um, school-based assessment so it was externally moderated by the QCAA but all the assessment was written by the classroom teacher and because of that um, this the standard of the assessment might be quite different across the state so there was a common core skills test which was to sort of compare one cohort of or group of students against another in different schools against uh, across the state. Um, that system tended to favour either really, really small schools where you had a very small cohort and so you weren't too affected by the other people in your, your year level, or it favoured really, really large schools um, where I don't, I don't want to, to, to be politically incorrect, but you you could sort of sort of bring along the weaker students could be hidden amongst the, the, the higher achieving students. So it sort of bumped everybody up a little bit. So um, a school like Fraser Ang Coast Anglican College has traditionally got really good OP results for the size of the school. We haven't been able to play either the very big school game or the very small school game. We've been in between where we've been very much affected by the cohort um, and the 
the range of abilities that you get in sort of a, a group of 30 to 40 students, you'll appreciate there is a huge range of abilities there. And you are also in that 30 to 40 students, you're going to have some real high flyers, but that's going to be balanced by some students who are not getting such high grades or aren't feeling as motivated. And that all of everyone's affected by everybody else's grades. So um, I feel that the new ATAR system will be a lot um, more transparent and fairer for um, students in a school like ours where we've sort of got that medium-sized school. We're not super small um, with really tiny numbers. Okay, so if a student is thinking of going into for a university pathway, they will most likely need an ATAR in order to get into the courses. So there's two ways in which you can do that. Um, you, first of all, you have to do an English subject. That wasn't the case in the old OP system, although we did recommend it. Um, but you now have to do either the general syllabus English, or you could do what's called an applied syllabus subject, which isn't as difficult or cognitively demanding, but it does tick the box for an English subject. So I'll, there we, we have um, two types of subject. Um, which are, have syllabuses written by the QCAA. General syllabus subjects are the harder version and tend to be taken by students who are looking at university entrance, whereas applied syllabus subjects, uh, as I say, are more applied. So they're more based in um, skill development and um, real world applications. We offer quite a number of applied syllabus subjects at the college. So things like um, the industrial design and graphics course is applied, aquatic practices, furnishing, um, our essential English and essential maths are all, they're just off the top of my head, all applied syllabus subjects, which can count towards an ATAR, but would normally be taken by students who weren't really looking to get an ATAR. So you could certainly get an ATAR, however, by having essential English, um, as long as you had another four general syllabus subjects. So um, the majority of uh, students looking to get an ATAR would have five general syllabus subjects, but you can also just have four and then have an applied syllabus subject, it could be the English, or you could go for the aquatics as, as an option. Um, my, my own son, if I, if I, I try not to overshare too much, but he was quite worried um, that he, his English might not be as high as it possibly could be. Now, when I speak to Mrs. Hallam, she's going, I don't know why he's worried about that. But when he was in grade 10, he thought maybe my English might not be my best subject. He's very good at maths and science. So you can sort of see where that's coming from. So he thought he might do aquatic practices because he can already scuba dive. We've been on lots of dive holidays. Um, he, he really enjoys that kind of thing. So if he took the aquatic practices, he'd be able to use four other general syllabus subjects, which would be maths and science type subjects, the aquatic practices and do the English as well. So at our school, we actually run with a six six um, subject load for most students. So he'd get his five generals and his aquatic practices. And what the ATAR does is actually works out your highest five marks. So he was thinking that English in those five possibly might not be it. So he was thinking his other four and his aquatic practices could get him a better ATAR than if he had five general syllabus subjects, which included English. So what I'm trying to show is that there's an awful lot of flexibility where students can sort of play to their strengths. Now, as a, a follow on to that story, um, aquatic practices clashed with chemistry and he already wanted to really wanted to do chemistry. So he had to he didn't get to, could get to do both subjects. So he, he ended up in the drama class. And he last year I was happy enough to sit there and watch him get the drama prize. So it did did work at Celebration of Achievement. So it, it did work out for the best. Um, but, and his idea about gaming the system didn't quite work for him. And he now has 
six general syllabus subjects which he's doing and he hasn't quite got the same amount of pressure in a way because he knows that his ATARs worked out from his best five so he's got six that he's working really hard on but he knows that if one of them he has a wobbly moment in one of them it's not going to affect his ATAR because it's it's worked out on his best five so having that safety net of a sixth subject is really really um, good and um, we certainly would recommend it the bulk of our students would do six subjects plus rave when they're in year 11 and 12 in order to get that balance and that safety net and also tick the box in terms of having an English subject um, if you look at the slide there as well as the applied syllabus subjects that we offer you could also combine that with um, a VET pathway, so um, a certificate course, which is competency based. So you either pass VET courses or you don't. Um, so that can have some advantages, um, particularly for students who find it really hard under exam conditions um, and, and struggle a little bit there. They could team their four general syllabus subjects or maybe even five up with a certificate three we offer certificate three in fitness we've got a student doing certificate three as a school-based apprenticeship in early childhood at the moment in grade 11 um, and we also offer certificate four courses um, the the most popular there being crime and justice so a certificate four obviously counts more towards the ATAR than a certificate course would so certificate three or higher um, can end up counting into the ATAR calculation so if you're thinking on the the lines of a humanities kind of pathway or legal pathway then the certificate for in crime and justice can be quite um, a, a good way of um, feeding into ATAR and getting some points some you know good mark there and also maybe reducing the stress of having to do five or six really hard subjects so i will just repeat that general syllabus subjects are harder than applied syllabus subjects so i occasionally get students who think that um, for example pe is going to be an easy subject pe is a general syllabus subject so it's got an, a level of academic rigor in it which can be quite challenging if you were looking for a, a practical subject. A practical subject really needs to be one of our applied syllabus subjects. I'll move on. Okay, so um, we basically very roughly break down our semesters through years 11 and 12 into four semesters altogether, which we call units of study. Um, units one and two are done in year 11. Um, we like to try and start Unit 3 in Year 11 as well, and then move into the assessment of Unit 3 when students get into Year 12. So we're usually talking about Unit 1, Unit 2, Unit 3, and Unit 4. Um, one thing to note is that Units 1 and 2 are actually treated separately by the QCAA, whereas Unit 3 and 4 are meshed together, and that has some... Um, implications for um, performance in year 12 which I'll cover as we go on and so our assessment in year 11 is formative however our students must demonstrate satisfactory achievement across the unit so they'll have pieces of assessment which have been written and marked by their teacher um, we can get audited by the QCAA so they can ask us for the previous year's year 11 um, evidence to show that students have reached satisfactory achievement I've had some conversations with year 11 students about well what does satisfactory achievement look like because we're marking um, the assessment in terms of percentages so we're actually looking at numbers not grades not a to e but actual percentages for pieces of assessment uh, very very roughly and broadly and i'll say this but i haven't written it down it's roughly about 40 percent is a pass for um, a piece of assessment now you have to realize that the assessment is cumulative so if the students do two pieces and say get 30% for their first piece 
which can happen because, you know, year 11 is new. You've got lots of things to juggle. Uh, maybe the cognitive load is a bit higher. Um, so you get 30% in your first piece. That doesn't mean you have failed unit one because you'll have a second piece of assessment and maybe you'll get 50% in your second piece of assessment. And if the two pieces are weighted evenly, then that would average out to 40. What the teacher would, and this is where I come in terms of vagueness in terms of the actual cut off what the teacher would then need to do is look at those two pieces of assessment together for the student and ask themselves is there sufficient evidence of satisfactory achievement of the syllabus standards now our teachers are very experienced at this and they're able to write assessment that will answer that question so probably the pieces on their own could do that but what we tend to do is have two pieces so you've got that sort of safety and averaging out. So you will have on your year 11 school report, you'll have the marks that the students get, but you'll also have a statement to say satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Satisfactory is what everybody's aiming for. Um, and that also provides what are called QC credits, which I'll cover in a future slide. Um, the importance of that is if students in year 11 are getting an unsatisfactory rating, that's a key, a cue to think, is this the best subject for my student? Should they be looking to switch into another subject before they get to year 12? You need to switch early and not leave it to halfway through year 12 and then suddenly go, oh, I'm still only getting 30% for every piece of assessment I'm doing and realise you're likely to overall not pass the subject. And that's really hard in year 12, well, almost impossible to change subjects because we are looking over two years. So my key message there is pass pass the unit one and unit two and aim for that satisfactory 40% or better um, in order to sort of have those in the bag. And if things aren't going well, talk early and there will be other options. So some things like picking up a, a school-based apprenticeship, picking up a VET course, switching out to crime and justice. Those are all things you could do or just switching subjects. So something that sounded really interesting when you're in grade 10, started it in grade 11, it's not quite what you're expecting. The time to move is early on in grade 11 when it starts to become apparent that things aren't going so well. So certainly by midterm two, if things haven't gone well in unit one, you'd be starting to ask questions and you can come and collect um, subject change forms from student services, which show you what other subjects are available at the same time. You can come and have a conversation with me. The best person to talk to, though, is the classroom teacher, because the classroom teacher will be very experienced and will have a bit of an idea as to, yes, I can see you're struggling, but I know I can help you get over the line. And I think if you change this, then things could be better. Or they might be looking at you going, what are you doing? And this isn't working for either of us. Uh, there won't be too many of those second ones. Uh, most of our teachers would think the same, the, the way of the first one. All right then, so I'll move on to year 12. So we've got year 11 under our belts. We've satisfactorily demonstrated all the um, syllabus standards. QCE points have racked up, had some experience of doing the various pieces of assessment. When the students move into year 12, they then um, look at units three and four, and these are what we call summative. So that means they count towards the ATAR. So there are three pieces of internal assessment, which are called IA1, IA, so IA stands for internal assessment. It's not very imaginative, is it? IA1, IA2, IA3. And then there's one piece of external assessment. Our teachers have to write the internal assessment. They write it the year before the year 12 students actually um, do their internal assessments. So at the moment at school, my teachers are writing assessment for our current 11s when they're in year 12. So we're working that year ahead. We write the assessment and then we have it endorsed by the QCAA before it's used to assess the students when they're in year 12. And once the assessment is um, checked by the QCAA, the marks are then, sorry, once the assessment is marked by the teachers, the marks are sent over to the QCAA or so uploaded online and they are checked. 
Um, so you'll you hopefully if you're a year 12 parent you'll have heard students talking about my, it's my provisional mark so when they first get it back it they are explained to that it could change hopefully not by very much if at all but it could change and we are currently in the process of the QCAA confirming our marks from the first piece of assessment so our IA1 pieces of assessment um, while I'm on this slide I will just say that because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, this year and this year only, the QCAA made the decision to actually reduce the amount of internal assessment for all Queensland schools down to two pieces. So everybody had already done the first piece, so IA1 was all done in the first term, so pre-pandemic. Um, the second piece of assessment different subjects have different types of assessment for IA2 and IA3. So there was advice um, produced by the QCAA which said you've either got to do IA2 or you've got to skip IA2 and you've got to do IA3. And there were in some schools it was you can have a choice of which one you do and which one you do. So I can pr tell you for in the sciences um, we had the choice of whether to do IA2 which is a student experiment or IA3, which is a research investigation. Uh, and we as a school had already started our IA2s and our students had started to collecting data. So we made the decision to continue on with that task and our um, year 12 students for, for the sciences have just done IA1 and IA2. They won't be doing IA3. And the reason for that is that the QCAA have recognized that with that large chunk of teaching time taken out of year 12 with the remote learning and and the you know it, it was well managed for our school but there will be some schools around Queensland where there was a huge interruption of learning so the decision was to make it fair and to take that piece of assessment out now that won't happen hopefully we won't have any more pandemics in the near future and our current 11s will do three pieces of internal assessment um the final Point there that I just want to make before I move on to the next slide is that um, the dates when we set these pieces of internal assessment aren't negotiable so we can't we ha we don't have very much flexibility at all in terms of rescheduling ex exams and due dates because of things which could be avoided so that family holidays one is one to be very careful of um, obviously if the student has um, an accident or they call it illness or misadventure so if you have like a family bereavement or a, a sudden illness or you know a car accident or something awful happens we will we can there are ways around it but we have to communicate with the QCAA um, and, and my, one of my roles is that nexus between the school and the QCAA so I go onto the portal and I write what extenuating circumstances have occurred and what we'll do about it. Um, it becomes quite messy if the task is an exam so um, IA1 for the sciences and um, or in maths IA2 and IA3 are all exams so you obviously can't do an exam late because that could give you some um, you know you could find out what the questions were about so it could give you some advantage so the teachers have to actually have to write a comparable piece of assessment and the students who don't sit the assessment on the day for legitimate reasons then have to set it on another day so um it you know that idea of oh i'm i've got something else you know a driving test booked that that can't happen in year 12. so um moving on I'll just talk a little bit more briefly about um, the internal assessment. So um, because they get written and uploaded into a portal, they, they come out looking all fairly generic with um, QCAA branding on them. As I mentioned, they're developed and marked by the teacher, but they have to be endorsed before they can be used. And so um, the teacher will get some feedback as to whether what the test or the piece of assessment that they've written is actually assessing what the syllabus says it should be and whether it is equitable to all students whether it's well worded whether it's well laid out and explains clearly what the students have to do in or and allows the students to get the highest possible grades um, and, and those grades are, are 
open to them. So the good news is for QC, um, for Fraser Coast Anglican College is that we have got a number of teachers on staff who are endorsers. So they do work for the QCAA and they endorse assessment items from other schools across Queensland. And we have some teachers who are lead endorsers. So they work at that slightly higher level and looking at feedback from endorsers and working with schools in order to um, improve their assessment items. That's a huge benefit to both our teaching staff and to our students in that our teachers get so much professional development and, and insights into what the landscape of assessment is across Queensland. And our students, obviously benefit from getting the very best possible assessment um, that's clear and transparent and, and they're well prepared for and our, our teachers know that it's it's going to do the job. So um, the, as I mentioned before, the marks are confirmed by the QCAA. So again, when I say QCAA, it's teachers employed by the QCAA who do a lot of this work. And again, we've got teachers at our school who are confirmers and lead confirmers um, working for the QCAA, looking at marked student work, looking at um, the instrument specific marking guide or the standards that that's marked against and um, checking that the teacher judgment of the student work matches the marks that the student has been awarded. And that can be from anywhere in Queensland and a typical teacher might look at sort of 15 to 20 different schools and students from within those schools and provide feedback to a lead confirmer who would then work with a chief confirmer and, and with the schools. So we're, as I say, we're in the process of that right now at the moment. Um, I've got stuff to upload before Friday, um, which is part of that confirmation process. So the, the results from that are coming back and the, the majority of our um, results at Fraser Coast Anglican College have been confirmed. So our teachers are working, they're spot on. So I've just got a few little lobs and sods to sort of tie up, but we are very much um, well placed to be, you know, writing good quality assessment and marking it and matching it to the syllabus standards, which in my role makes my job much, much easier. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Okay, um, the other final piece of assessment for year 12s is the external assessment. So this is totally new for Queensland. Students in Queensland haven't done common subject-based exams since 1972. So think about that. Now, I wasn't even in school in 1972. So that means that the, if, you, if you're if you a teacher and you've only taught in Queensland, you've only lived in Queensland, you've really had no experience of external assessment. Now, again, teachers at Fraser Coast Anglican College have a diverse range of backgrounds. Many come from interstate and some come from overseas and have um, experienced an exam-based um, system. So um, we are well, again, well placed to prepare our students for those external exams. So if you've come from other states, you'll be familiar with the idea that it, there's, well, there's two chemistry papers. I keep mentioning chemistry because that's my subject. There's two chemistry papers, paper one and paper two, imaginatively named, but paper one happens on a particular day. Everybody in Queensland who's studying chemistry does the same paper at the same time. The um, chemistry paper has not been seen by me or by Mrs. Herford or by anybody else that teaches in a school in Queensland. So we haven't seen the final papers and we won't see them until the day. Um, they'll be conducted across the state in term four. So our year 12 students will have three and a half weeks of external testing through weeks four through to seven. And I've said here that they're assess assessing subject matter from units three and four. For some subjects, it's only unit four, and for some subjects, it's only part of unit four. So, But it's certainly not units one and two. So that's the main reason I put that in there. So it's all of what they've learned in year 12 can be assessed in that external assessment. Now on the QCAA website, they do have um, in the student side to the portal, they have public um, availability of sample assessments. So you can, if you go digging around in there, actually find the, um, the sample assessment and have a little bit of a look at 
what that exam is likely to look like. Um, there is a school use only um, external assessment sample, and we'll be using that to do mock exams with our year 12s. So we, our um, goal is to have the students used to this formal testing and quite intense testing. That's every single subject tested. Um, although that three and a half weeks has got subjects like that we don't offer, you know, we don't offer accounting or, um, I don't know, Japanese or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander studies of some of the general syllabus subjects which we don't offer at our school, but they have to fit into that, that timetable. So that's why it stretches over that time. But our students will expect to have an exam in the morning, an exam in the afternoon, another exam the next day. Our year 12s have got a copy of the timetable and I can certainly send that out, well, we'll send that out to parents closer to the time. Okay, um, the other thing to note about external assessment, and this again, the year 12 students will be all over this, but um, if you're, you've got students in lower years, you might be interested in the balance. Um, for maths and science subjects, super easy to write really good exams that test knowledge and understanding and analysis and so on of the content in the syllabus and so we love exams and so therefore we've got a weighting of 50 percent of the um the final mark is from the external exam and 50 percent from those internal pieces of assessment for other subjects it's not as easy to test the range of diverse skills that might be involved in that subject for example visual art or drama or e english modern history where it's really about researching and, and putting together larger project-based items. Um, those general subjects are tested by just 25% of the mark that comes from the external assessment and 75% from the internal assessment. Um, I will just mention ARA applications. So ARA stands for Alternative Access Arrangements. Alter Alternative access and reasonable adjustments something like that so it's been a long night um so it's for, for students who've got um ongoing medical issues um which affect their learning so it might mean that they they need I, I just thinking off the top of my head as for an ongoing um, condition might be dyslexia, for example. So a, dis, a student with dyslexia would be reasonably um, offered extra time to, to read through and, and process. And they might even want to um, use a computer to, to write their, their exams rather than handwriting. So um, we apply for an ARA for students with ongoing issues, medical issues even, things which are impacting on their ability to be at school and, and meaning that they need longer assessment periods or um, alternative seating. Anxiety is perhaps a, another common uh, ailment, unfortunately, that we would be in a position to offer some sort of reasonable adjustment to make it equitable so that that student wasn't being um, unfairly discriminated against as a result of their condition. Um, on the day of the external assessment, there are arrangements that can be made for students who wake up on the day and are just not well at all. And we will talk to our year 12s about um, what the best um, sort of way forward with that is. Uh, in a nutshell, it's a good idea to come unless you're like on the toilet and vomiting or whatever. Um, it's a really good idea to come and, and do your best. We would still put in an R to say that you were unwell and it would have to have, to have some um, medical certificate sort of support for that. And then they would look to see whether students who'd got similar results to you in the internal assessment and how they went on the external assessment compared to you. So if they'd got similar results to you on the internal assessment and you did loads better in the external assessment, maybe it's just the questions you were expecting and, and it went really well, you'd get your higher mark. If you are you know, genuinely feeling awful and just not functioning at your usual ability and you're down here, then because the R has gone there and we've, we've said that there's some illness or there's some, some good reason for that, um, you'd get the average 
for the other students that were similar to you at internal assessment time. So as I say, the QCAA really do work with schools to provide the best possible outcomes for students. And so there is a lot of um, sort of um, rigor around how things are done, um, but at the same time, we, we do realize that students have unique um, conditions and, and things going on that, that mean that we can and allow for that. So these are reasonable adjustments, access arrangements and reasonable adjustments. So if you have a student in grade 11 who has an ongoing condition <coughs> that would mean that they, they would be looking for additional time in an exam or maybe a, being able to, to get up in an exam and go out for a rest break or and that sort of thing, then do um, make a um, contact with me and I can sit down with you and we can apply for that adjustment. You will need um, a doctor's and a medical sort of background as to what that condition is. So again, you can hop onto the QCAA website and they've got a whole section there with um, the policies and procedures in place for um, our arrangements. Alrighty, um, I've just kept this slide in here. It's one of the ones that we use for um, subject choices and you know, really around this whole ATAR business, students really do still need to be choosing senior subjects that they enjoy. Um, if you're, as a parent, really hoping that your child gets a 99.95 ATAR and therefore you're telling them, no, you can't do these subjects, you've got to do like really hard subjects that might scale higher, that's not always a good idea because your student will have a very miserable couple of years and you'll tend to find they don't do as well as you were hoping. Um, so really do listen to your student and allow them to choose subjects that they enjoy, that they're good at and also as part of our year 10 um, senior education and training um, set planning we do look at you know what are they likely to want to do at university or after school and what subjects do you need in order to be able to do that so that's what we call prerequisite subjects so if you're wanting to do for example primary education you want to be a primary school teacher you have to have a science at year 11 and 12 and that science could be biology chemistry or physics choose the one you enjoy most and that you're best at and that ticks the box for that. Okay, um, this point here that um, the STEM subjects, so the science, um, the design, the engineering, and um, the maths, harder math subjects, and the challenging general subjects, so some of the languages would, would scale higher than other subjects. And again, I can't say at this point what would scale higher. The only one I could tell you for definite is we offer three different types of maths. So there's general maths and maths methods. And then there's specialist maths. Now specialist maths you have to do <coughs> with the methods anyway, and that is the hardest. But of these two, the general and the methods, we know that methods is harder than general maths. So if a student got 75%, let's say, in general maths, that's not going to count the same as 75% in maths methods. The maths methods has to scale upwards to show that it's harder to get 75% in methods than it is to get 75% in general. So that scaling is done by QTAC after the external exams. So we're not going to know ahead of time. And it's certainly, a, as, a, as an educator and as a mother, I would firmly say, if your student is not strong in maths, but still wants to do a math subject and go to university, pick the general one, because that will pick, tick the general's syllabus subject and they will do better at it because they won't be struggling. So don't force them into hard subjects just because you think that would get them a better ATAR. You may well find that your student who does general maths manages to get 80% in it, whereas if you force them into methods, they might have been struggling and miserable and getting in the 60s. And of course, an 80 in general is probably going to still be worth more than 60 something in the methods, but I can't see how much. Okay, um, one slide that I, I kept in here as well is the fact that 
as I mentioned at the very start with the, the two circles, um, vocational educational training pathways do count into ATAR. In, previously, they weren't involved in the OP, so you sort of had to go one way or the other. Um, with the new ATAR system, they are rec recognising that um, Certificate 3 and 4 courses excuse me, could count just as much as some um, general or applied syllabus subjects. So they can be incorporated into the ATAR, or you could have some universities would actually use that um, certificate course instead of the ATAR. They'll sort of look at which is higher. So um, some legal and justice type studies might well take that cert for in crime and justice in place of the ATAR. So they'd look at both of them and, and say well you've got the cert for so you can come into our course even if your ATAR is not quite as crash hot so it can be used as a basis for admission that's why that slides there and certainly we're thinking about to give some balance um, particularly if you're going to do the the four plus one so you'll keep yourself ATAR eligible so there's that pathway available but also your student may well just flourish in terms of doing a school-based apprenticeship and that could lead straight into a, a work opportunity from school without having to pay for higher education and go the university pathway. So this is really what I'm saying is do you need an ATAR? Well not unless you're planning to go directly into university straight from school. Um, all of our year 12 students should be aiming to achieve what we call a Queensland Certificate of Education, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, that's the thing that's produced by the QCAA. This is my point that I've been trying to make on the last couple of slides. Choose the subjects that the students are interested in, that they've got the ability to do and that align with whatever they want to do into the future. And at our school, we have a huge range of different possibilities that something that hopefully suits everybody so just quickly on the what is the QCE <coughs> um, the QCE the Queensland Certificate of Education is the thing that everybody should get when they finish year 12 whether they're going on an ATAR pathway or not um, you need to pass um, units of subjects so these 20 credits are broadly got by doing um, at least five subjects for four units. So five times four makes 20. As I mentioned before, our students do six. So they've got a bit of a safety net and they'll be on track for 24 credits. Uh, students that do a certificate course will find that they're often worth six or eight points. So you could drop a, a subject and pick up a certificate course and actually end up with more credits towards the QCE. Um, you have to get that set standard so you have to actually show satisfactory achievement so you've got to pass the subject there has to be some um, passing of units in um, English and maths so you have to pass at least one unit at, at satisfactory level and you have to have done this basically is saying you have to do three subjects for four semesters so that's where you get the 12 uh, so I'll just summarise that briefly. Everybody's after a QCE, 20 credits. You could do either five general and four, four general and applied, in which case you'd be getting an ATAR on your QCE, and you then would be eligible for direct entry into a university or a TAFE. Um, some TAFEs will be looking at ATARs, many wouldn't. Uh, that's what we mean there by tertiary. On this side, if you do less than four general syllabus subjects, you automatically are not ATAR eligible, but you would still be on track to get that QCE. So that's our goal for every single student while they're at um, school is to get that magic 20 QCE points. And that would then lead them into you know, the Defence Force, Work, TAFE, Apprenticeships, or some, some universities will take students without ATARs, but that's a story for another day. Okay, so very quickly, some myths. So I'll click it up and then you can decide true or false. So I'll let you think. And the answer is no, because if you pick physics and then do poorly in it, that's not going to increase your ATAR. If you pick physics and do super well in it, yes, it will increase your ATAR, but so would be doing super well in something else. Um, is there a pattern of subjects that will guarantee an ATAR of 
technically no. Um, however, if you want to get 99.95, you probably can't do it with um, an applied syllabus subject or um, a, a VET course. So my son's you know, aquatic practices would never have allowed him if he was relying on that to get that 99.95. However, he's not trying for medicine, so he's not aiming for 99.95 either. So it would still have worked. Okay, um, does it matter what school the student attends or what postcode they live in? No, nope. they shouldn't feature in the ATAR or they won't feature in the ATAR calculation. To my mind, the ATAR is a lot fairer than the previous OP system. So um, it should be far more transparent and as I say, fairer for our students. Um, will QTAC have an ATAR calculator that we can stick the student data in and work out? No. So, and th this again is a, a tricky area. You can't really work out what the students are likely to get. Um, we'll only really know that once they've done, well, once they've done their external assessment, it's been marked and then it's released. That's when you'll know. Um, we can, I, I have this year um, worked with a, a company called ATAR Active to get an estimate of what ATAR our students are likely to get, our year 12 students this is, based on their year 11 data. So I went through the year 11 end of year reports, pulled off their percentages and I've sent it to ATAR Active and, and they've run it through a few different mathematical modeling programs and they've got what we're calling an estimate of a likely ATAR. My reason for doing that is twofold. One is that it often really sharing that estimate with students can be a real source of motivation because they know how hard they worked in year 11 and they know if they do a little bit more they might get to where they want to get. So um, and also they know how hard they want to get and they often their ATAR estimate will be more positive than some students will be thinking. So they'll tend to underestimate how good they are and you'll be able to give them that well you know you're already on track for a 75 and then they go okay well if I did a little bit more I might be able to get into the 80s so it's those kind of conversations but it is very much an estimate not um, a prediction of what's actually going to happen and my other reason for doing it is because the students apply for Q through QTAC for university places in August now, in order to make good choices about what university courses are open to them, they need to have a bit of an idea as to what ATAR they'd likely be tracking towards. So it's no use for a student who's tracking towards an ATAR of 60 to be applying for all the universities that offer medicine. That's, that's how it, it, if, you were, if you were really wanted to be a doctor in the future and you were on track to get an ATAR 60, you need to be looking at other pathways into medicine for doing different degrees uh, beforehand. So that's, that's the brutal um, reality of it. So students need to, to get that encouragement, but also have a realistic idea of where they're tracking to. And only the student knows how hard they were working in year 11 and how much harder they can work in year 12. Okay, a couple more. Will QTAC be giving any scaling information? I think I've covered that. That's a definite no. They'll only give it to us after the students' um, results are out. So if your child is in grade 11, you might be interested in that because it does mean you can look at what, what previous scaling was like. So I would be able to say, traditionally, physics does scale higher than chemistry. Like it used to in the OB system, so I'm assuming it will, but maybe not by very much, who knows. And when will they be releasing it? Um, in December, and then annually. So if your student is not in year 12, but below that, I'll be able to be a bit more specific on what the scaling history has been like. But it's likely that they'll scale things differently every year, so it'll still only be a rough go. Okay, well, I have talked for almost the whole hour. So that's a 54 minute presentation. Hopefully you have found it useful. Um, if you have any questions, my main ad advice is to go on the QCAA website. Um, <coughs> I've mentioned before that I've done those ATAR um, estimates. I've been working my way through the year 12 students. So if you have a year 12 student and you ask them, have you had your ATAR estimate? 
Answer is probably yes, but they may have not shared it with you. I can certainly flick it through to you if there's some disagreement <laughs> as to whether they know it or not. And then my final one, I've just clicked off the slide, unfortunately, was that um, the, you can also obviously contact the school. So I'll just go back to it with all the different people. Um, so you can see there that um, if you want advice around university pathways particularly robin is a really good um, person to to check in with there um, this is me director of teaching and learning um, julianne's very knowledgeable in terms of um, all things senior and our if you're um, looking at possible certificate courses then we have a pathways officer jen nolan she's also the person that coordinates work experience so you may have had contact with previously so you've got a, a raft of different people who can help but if you haven't gone on this website yet <laughs> make it a favorite okay good night i'll stop talking there